to Just a Pinch Podcast with Injector Kristen. Join me and industry experts as we discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly of the aesthetics, wellness, and fitness industries. Welcome back to Just a Pinch Podcast. Today is going to be a solo episode with moi, and it is going to be audio only, so no video on this one, and I'm going to be talking about non-energy-based microneedling. Um, I'm going to be referring to it as skin pen because that's the device that I personally use and practice, uh, but there's a variety of different devices, and we'll go over that too. So what is microneedling? Uh, in, in a nutshell, it's collagen induction therapy, and the goal is to stimulate collagen and elastin production in your skin, uh, but it also does a lot more. It's going to stimulate a lot more than just that. Uh, so in a nutshell, it is introducing tiny multiple needles into the skin at specified depths to create micro trauma. This trauma is going to lead to a cascade of reactions in the skin that ultimately leads to remodeling of tissue and support structures. Microneedling first started out kind of barbarically. Um, one of the first types of devices was a microneedling roller, and they're actually still available on the market today. Um, it started off as an in-office treatment, and then they ended up on you know retail shelves and for home use, and you can still find them today. Stay away from them. Leave them on the shelf where they belong. They're trash. Um, in my opinion, they are very prehistoric technology. Uh, they deserve to be petrified in stone and not used anymore, but be respected as a pioneer in the field. Um, that's, that's my thoughts on rollers. Um, and I say that about rollers because the needles are not entering the skin flush to the skin. They're entering at different angles because they're on a, a 3D roller. Uh, so as some of those needles are entering the skin, there's others that are being removed and they're being torn out of the skin and they can actually create a lot more trauma uh, than what you're looking for. And you have an increased risk of scarring and just straight up damage to the skin. So leave them be. Um, you also really can't get them clean. They're not for multi-use. They're not for repeated use. Uh, those needles are going to get dull and there's no way to clean. I mean, needles should never be reused. Um, so unless it's literally a one-time use roller, which these home devices are not, they expect you to keep on using them, throw them away. You're going to give yourself an infection. The depth of penetration is also somewhat dependent upon the pressure being applied to this, this roller. Uh, so there's a lot of uncontrolled factors with it. If, if you're pushing hard versus if you're barely pushing. So your depth control is trash. Um, so then evolved microneedling pens, um, and there's a multitude of them on the market, but only a few of them are truly FDA cleared and approved, um, and they are the ones that are truly safer and are sterile for use. These pens contain a motorized handle and a, either battery or plug-in, and then there's disposable one-time use needle tips that are in a cartridge. Um, they typically will range between 12 to 36 needles. Um, that's the most common. Um, I kind of describe it to patients similarly to like almost like a tattoo machine, um, except quite literally not at all. But if you think of microneedling, it's as close as we can get. So the, these pens are going to allow you to choose the depth at which you want the needles to go. Some of them will let you control the speed as well. The speed is a lot less important as the depth uh, and also just the integrity of the needles too. Some needles of lesser brands will get dull very quickly and they're going to have a lot of resistance and actually bounce off of the skin as opposed to um, truly entering the skin and staying at the depth that it's, it's supposed to be at. So if you are a provider shopping around for a microneedling pen, make sure that you're finding out about the integrity of the needles and if their um, safety and data standards are actually being able to be proved that those needles are hitting the depths that they should be hitting from start to finish. Only use FDA cleared devices as they've been able to prove their safety and, and safety is the big key here. Um, a big concern is cross-contamination and some devices, even those with disposable needle tips and that can look like they're legitimate, can get contaminated with blood and body fluids into the handle and head itself and then cross-contaminate when you put on a new needle cartridge. And there was a case in, um, I think it was New Mexico, don't quote me on this, I, somewhere along the border, uh, where a med spa had a horrifying um, issue that popped up. They were using a non-FDA cleared device and they actually spread HIV to their patients. Um, so that's a 
big freaking deal um, to go through from microneedling. So another reason to ask your provider what type of pen they use. Is it FDA cleared? Um, you know, know ahead of time. Don't ask after it's already said and done. The pen base should also have a disposable sanitation cover on it to help reduce cross-contamination. Um, so that's always something that you need to look at too. You, the provider should not just be holding the base of the pen with you know, gloved hand and nothing over the base itself. So some tips for patients to make sure that they are getting reliable and safe microneedling. Ask the actual name of the device being used and if it's FDA cleared. Watch them take a new needle cartridge out of the sterile packaging prior to using it on you and make sure that there's a cover on the pen device as well. Some of the best FDA cleared microneedling devices include Skin Pen, that's what I use, uh, the Eclipse Micro Pen, Derma Pen, uh, Candela makes an Exceed Micro Pen, MD Pen, and then there's more. You know, that's it's not a, a full list. Those are the ones off the top of my head that I got for you. And uh, New Age microneedling also now includes using targeted products and serums topically during the treatment that those needles are actually driving deep into the dermal layer of the skin and they really act like lighter fluid for treatment outcomes. Some of my favorite uh, target products to use during a microneedling session be plain old hyaluronic acid, um, but it needs to be sterile. It can't, you can't just use any you know, hyaluronic acid off the shelf, so it needs to be one that is sterile and meant to be used with microneedling. Uh, you could also use PRP or PRF. Uh, this is really popular. I mean, it still is popular, but I will say that it is inconsistent. And oftentimes it is actually not PRP, platelet-rich plasma, but it's just concentrated plasma. It's actually quite difficult to truly, truly get true PRP, platelet-rich plasma. It needs to be concentrated. I, I believe it's like a, a, a 10 to 1 concentration. So you have to draw a lot of blood and be taking off just the right part rate above those red blood cells to be able to make this true PRP. Um, so PRP, I don't love, honestly, I don't use it. Uh, PRF, if I'm going to use a blood product with microneedling, it's going to be PRF. We use cell fill kits. They are, you know, they're, they're tried, they're true. There's data behind them to back it up and they're relatively consistent. Now, when I say consistent, it means the technology itself. What is inconsistent is also what's coming out of your own body. And it, varies day by day. So if you don't have healthy blood, healthy platelets, uh, good nutrition in, in your body, your own PRP or PRF might be trash. It might not, you know, be doing what it needs to do. So there's a wide range of quality of the blood products. So I don't love them. I'm moving away from them. They have their time in their place, but I don't like it here. Now, the thing that is really going to be taking over the market, it already is, and I'm already loving it, is exosomes. Uh, this is a really hot topic and some of the newest and best stem cell technology out there today. Uh, what I love about it is that it is consistent. Uh, you know exactly what you're getting. And we are typically using uh, Benev, well, always Benev exosomes, and we're typically using their 5 billion uh, exosome vials. They make one that's two and a half. Why well, use two and a half when you can do five? So we always buy their fives, and when they come out with a ten, we'll get their ten. But with exosomes, you also need to be sure that you're getting those from a reputable brand for purity standards. Like I said, we use Benev. There's other brands out there that are excellent as well. Um, you're gonna be hearing all about exosomes in the future. You know, IV therapy uh, as, as use of an injectable uses in skincare, everything. So exosomes are ultimately the messages that stem cells are sending. So it's not a stem cell itself, it's a byproduct of a stem cell. The Benev brand that we use are derived from human adipose tissue or human fat. Great, great product to put on the skin. Uh, I use exosomes in practice in a lot of different areas, but using it with microneedling is honestly one of my favorites. Not only does it help you heal faster, you are really, really getting some some really great stimulation, um, not just from the microneedling, but from the exosomes themselves. Um, so there's other hyaluronic acid blends and glide serums out there. Some companies, when you buy a kit, you will get a you know a single use serum that you're supposed to use with it as well. Basically, you want some sort of glide on the skin so that that pen will travel smoothly across the skin. Microneedling skin dry is painful and brutal, and don't do it to somebody because that's wrong. Uh, you can add different types of growth factors and peptides and stem cell derivatives. Um, all of these can augment your treatment results and decrease your downtime. 
So what can microneedling treat? It can treat a lot. Um, it can treat scarring of all types, hyperpigmentation. Now with that asterisk, you do need to be careful in some patients that are prone to hyperpigmentation, particularly uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation or PIH, uh, or if they are prone to um, keloid scarring. If you, I mean, if you keloid, I'm not, I'm not doing this on you. There's a lot of things you're not going to get done if you keloid. Uh, this can also be used to treat rosacea, acne, skin texture issues, wrinkles, laxity. I mean, you name it. This can, this can do a lot for your skin. So when those needles are entering the dermal layer of the skin, they're causing this micro trauma and an inflammatory cascade is going to begin immediately. And I'm not going to bore you with the whole inflammatory pathway and the growth factor pathways involved, but know that it exists and this is why we're doing it in the first place. So this is going to result in the release of a very wide variety of different growth factors. And those growth factors are going to be stimulating different components of the skin and support structures. It's going to create collagen and elastin as its end byproducts. So it's going to also strengthen the capillary bed of our skin. This is how it helps rosacea. It, you can pair that with collagen boosting, and it's going to give that real nice improvement with rosacea. Uh, now, mind you, rosacea may initially flare up as the skin is inflamed, but it will calm down afterwards, especially if you're using those exosomes. Microneedling will also downregulate sebaceous glands or oil glands, so this can help reduce oiliness and help with acne. Now, it is controversial about microneedling over active acne lesions, but technically from a biological level, you are creating trauma around those lesions, um, and that's going to trigger the white blood cell immune response cascade, and that's going to bring infection fighters, which can help clear up active lesions as well. So I'm not saying microneedle over active acne, but technically you can. Um, if it's something that you want to play around with, you know, do your skip the acne lesions as you're going through the entire face, save them for the, the end, and then hit them at the end. But things that you need to be worried about, about treating over active acne, is transferring bacteria from one lesion to another or into other parts of the skin. So things to be aware of. Vascular growth factors are also going to be triggered. So you're going to get formation of new blood vessels, which are going to bring oxygen and nutrients to the skin. When you microneedle the scalp, your growth factor cascade is helping put a higher percentage of hair follicles into an active growth phase. So you're getting more hairs actively growing at once. So you're going to get thicker hair, more visible hair, and improve vascularity for nutrition and oxygen. Microneedling on its own will stimulate this, and microneedling exosomes really high quality PRP or PRF or even some hair growth vitamins and drugs into the skin of the scalp can really help um, improve hair growth in these areas. Microneedling for scalp and for hair restoration is best done when you still have hair on your head and you are just starting to notice a little bit of thinning. So when you start noticing those first signs of thinning, that is the time to start your microneedling or PRP, PRF, exosome, your treatment with that. There's some other growth factors that get released with microneedling that will help regulate melanocyte production. This is going to help improve the appearance of hyperpigmentation and in some cases even prevent it from forming in the future. When is the best time to start microneedling? So once you hit your early 20s, feel free you know, or start for, for general prevention, uh, but we can do it at any age to help with any of the skin conditions I lifted, listed above um, if you're under 18 with parental consent. But once you're in your early 20s, your collagen has peaked and you are starting to lose 1% a year. This is not the first time you've heard me mention that one. So once you hit your early 20s, you want to get on that preventative train, perfect time. Now, how often should you be microneedling? So the best results for microneedling are seen after doing a series of treatments. One single session is better than nothing, but you're unlikely to see major changes after one. Typically, I'm going to recommend a minimum of a series of three spaced every couple weeks to a month or so. For more severe skin conditions like scarring, I'm going to recommend potentially many more. And then plan on maintenance sessions after the initial series as well. You're going to notice some immediate superficial results in your skin as soon as the initial he healing phase has completed after a couple of days. But the maximum results are going to be seen in about three to six months after each session. Collagen and elastin, they are lazy, lazy, so they do take their time. So be patient with your results. Don't expect that one month after your treatment that your scars are going to be gone and your skin's going to be tighter. It's in there. It's doing its thing. Got to be patient. 
If you're microneedling for general prevention and skin health, I do recommend do one session every six months. This is going to keep your skin in a constant state of repair and rejuvenation. And what are some side effects of microneedling? Initially, you're going to be pink to red, and you may see some dried blood spots on your skin or even have a little bit of bleeding, and this is normal. Your skin is going to feel dry for a few days as it's healing, and it's going to be more sensitive to heat and the sun. It's very important to stay out of the sun and to wear sunscreen for several weeks during the post-treatment period to help avoid triggering hyperpigmentation and UV damage. Your skin will have thousands of tiny needle holes in it, and those little holes are going to stay open for about 18 to 24 hours in some cases uh, post-treatment. So it's really important to be extraordinarily clean and careful with your skin for the first day after treatment, or you could develop an infection. Don't go to the gym or sweat or wear makeup for at least the first 24 hours and avoid wearing a hat if, uh, if it's resting on your forehead or especially if you had microneedling to your scalp, no hats, at least for 24 hours. Only put products on your skin that your provider has instructed you to do. Using harsh products or certain acids or actives or ingredients can cause pain, inflammation, scarring, and can actually make your skin worse. You wanna cleanse your skin with lukewarm to cool water, a gentle cleanser, or even just hypochlorous acid after 12 hours. Hyaluronic acid serums, such as um, hydrating B5 gel from SkinCeuticals, Elastin Immerse, or others can be great options. Uh, the Skin V hyaluronic acid serum is amazing after treatment too. Now, vitamin C is okay technically after 24 hours, but some people will be sensitive to this. So make sure that you do a small test spot to make sure that you do okay. Um, it might feel a little extra spicy. You wanna make sure that your skin doesn't um, break out in any type of rash afterwards. You want to use a non-comedogenic moisturizer if you're extra dry. I love the Elastin moisturizers and both of their sunscreens post-treatment. They have their ultralight moisturizer if you just need a little bit. They have the Ultra Nourishing if you're extra dry. Um, Hydratint SPF, which is a tinted sunscreen, which is great post-treatment because it kind of hides a little bit of the pink. They also have a mineral silk, uh, mineral-based sunscreen as well. No tint to that one. The best products, in my opinion, pre and post treatment is going to be the Elastin Nectar, their restorative skin nectar. When you pre-treat for two to three weeks prior, it's going to clear out dead, broken collagen and elastin fragments from the skin. I call it the, the collagen graveyard, and it makes it easier for, uh, for new, fresh collagen and elastin to form. Post treatment, it's very soothing. It's going to help improve the speed of your recovery significantly. So how do you prep for a microneedling treatment? Now, if you are an A plus student and you want to do the absolute best possible thing for your skin, you're going to start your elastin nectar a couple weeks prior to prejuvenate your skin. If you use retinols or tretinoin, I want you to stop using them seven days prior to your treatment and stay off of them for one to two weeks post treatment. If you are doing a series of three or more all in a row, it's like a monthly treatment, honestly, I recommend just stay off the retinol. Use it as a little retinol vacation. You can switch to a Bacuchiol serum if you want to keep that cellular turnover going. Um, but it's easier to just stay off the retinol and then get back on it, you know, taper back on once you're, you're done with your series. If you use hydroquinone, I want you to stop that at least 24 hours prior to your treatment. And also stop benzoyl peroxide, glycolic acid, any of your harsh exfoliators at least 24 hours prior, especially if you're sensitive. I want you to wear a SPF daily, greater than 30. Try to avoid direct sun exposure for the week leading up to your appointment. And avoid sun and UV exposure for a few weeks post-treatment to help reduce the risk of hyperpigmentation. If you show up to your appointment for microneedling with a sunburn, guess what? You just wasted everybody's time, including your own, and we're going to send you away. Nothing is happening to sunburned skin. I promise you that. If you are prone to hyperpigmentation, ask your provider about a regimen to start um, as, a, as a pigment fighter. I like hydroquinone. Um, I also absolutely adore the Elastin Illuminate. The Illuminate is actually my preference. Um, hydroquinone, I want you to wait at least five to seven days after. Vitamin C, 24 hours after. Illuminate can start about two to three days after. But here's a part that, uh, that I've, I've learned over the years of, of utilizing microneedling on my own skin and other people's. It truly doesn't matter how deep somebody's microneedling device can go. The only time that it's beneficial to have deep penetration of the skin is if you have thickened skin from scarring that you need to break through and break up. Otherwise, for all the other treatment indications, we're only targeting the dermal layer of the skin and specifically the papillary dermis, which in most skin is only about 
half a millimeter to a millimeter deep. So it's okay if you overshoot your target because you're still passing through it and you're gonna get that inflammation. But if you go too deep, you're gonna be too aggressive. It's just gonna cause pain, excess trauma, and increased risk of side effects. So deeper is not always better just because it can go three millimeters deep. My gosh, please do not do that on my face. I want it to go right where it needs to to get that stimulation. And a lot of people ask, does microneedling hurt? It doesn't have to. Um, I numb all my patients with a prescription strength topical numbing cream prior to treatment. Uh, but if you're a tough bitch, you can do it without it. Um, I'll oftentimes do mine without numbing cream just because I can't stand being numb. I'd rather have a little bit of discomfort than be numb. Uh, and with this, honestly, it's a little bit of discomfort. If you're extra sensitive or nervous, we can always use Pronox laughing gas during the treatment or even do nerve blocks. But honestly, a nerve block for skin pen microneedling is 100% unnecessary for this level of treatment. Uh, it's going to feel a little bit like a vibration on your skin. You might feel a little pinch here or there. Um, if your numbing is light, afterwards, you're going to feel hot like a sunburn for a few hours due to that inflammation. What are some of the typical costs of microneedling? Uh, that can widely, widely vary state by state, by practice, by area. And laws are also different in each state as to who can perform this treatment. Um, some say it's okay for an esthetician to perform, while others require a minimum of an, a registered nurse to perform the treatment. I know in the state of Connecticut, you need to be at least a registered nurse in order to perform uh, this treatment. I've seen it advertised as low as $200, which to me is honestly a little bit concerning because to me that's making me question what kind of device is that and is it legit um, you know same thing like when I talked about bootleg aesthetics you know this could potentially be bootleg so if the price seems too good to be true it probably is um, I've also seen treatments as upwards of $850 or more in luxury markets most average for a pen device style microneedling is going to be anywhere between $400 to $750 depending if you're having PRP, exosomes, or any other types of add-ons. Um, at Radiance Med Spa, we charge $400 for basic plain old microneedling. Uh, if you want to add exosomes or something fancy, then we're going to upcharge you to $600 because we got to cover our costs, girl. So what areas can you microneedle? Basically, if you've got skin, we can microneedle it within reason. Now, most common areas are going to be the face, the neck, the chest, the scalp for hair rejuvenation. Uh, we've done abdomens, thighs for stretch marks and skin tightening. I mean, we've done it all. Uh, we microneedle the scalp with the exosomes. It's a great alternative to injections for people that aren't ready to go that route yet. What about radiofrequency microneedling? I feel like we're hearing more about that than skin pen microneedling. Um, so it is similar, but different. And I'm going to do a whole different episode on radio frequency microneedling. And we offer it here. We have the Vivachi platform. We absolutely love it. It is a fan favorite. People do their series and keep coming back for more because they love it so much. Um, just, but the main difference, and I'm just going to touch on it briefly here, is that I see non-energy microneedling. So skin pen is going to stimulate a wide variety of growth factors, tons of them, and at good concentrations. Whereas radio frequency microneedling i think of it more as a micro needle delivery device of radio frequency heat so the main goal of rf microneedling is to create tiny micro micro thermal injuries under the skin so you get more skin tightening you're still going to get you know some growth factor releases some collagen and elastin you know all the good things you're still going to get some but because you are adding heat radio frequency heat to those needle tips that are right at that level of the dermis where we want all those good things to happen, that heat will denature some of those proteins that are being uh, in that cascade as a, an end byproduct. So you're going to have some inactivation of some of those growth factors. So depending on what the cause of your skin condition is, you know, what, what are we trying to treat? Am I trying to just do skin tightening? If our main goal is you know, we have loose, crepey skin, thin skin, we're looking to tighten, I'm going to reach for my RF microneedling. If somebody is specifically wanting to treat for pigment, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, rosacea, other conditions, I actually prefer the non-energy microneedling like the skin pen. Honestly, I do. It, I, I think that you can control the treatment a little bit better. Um, if I'm not trying to do it for skin tightening, there's in my opinion, not a whole heck of a lot of reason to pay 
a higher price for um, like let's say a Vivace treatment versus getting a wonderful treatment with skin pen and with or without exosomes, you know, or PRP or whatever it is that we're going to use. So I think that because RF microneedling got so popular with like Vivace, Morpheus 8, uh, Pixel, the Secret, Profound, I mean, there's a slew of them out there. They kind of became the, the hot word going around and all the traditional style pen style microneedling kind of got pushed to the background a little bit and don't sleep on it don't think that RF microneedling is the end-all be-all and that you know skin pens and other microneedling devices are ancient technology because they're not and they work and they are good and for a lot of people they're going to be a lot more affordable and tangible and easier to keep up with because it's a little bit more affordable to do uh, now, the RF microneedling, depending on how aggressive you're going, does potentially have a smidge less downtime than a skin pen. Skin pen will typically keep you pinker a little bit longer, but it, I mean, it really all depends on how aggressive your treatments are on, on both ends. So that's my, my two cents here on skin pen microneedling. If you have any questions about microneedling or anything that I covered today, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can always reach me by email at justapinchpodcast at gmail.com or Instagram's a great way as well. I'm at justapinchpodcast. Tune in next week for another episode. Thanks for joining me today. If you've been enjoying Just a Pinch, please consider taking a moment to rate and review on whatever listening platform you like to listen or watch on. Have an idea for an episode? let me know. I, I, this is all for, this is for you. You know, this is for the listeners. This is for education and what you want to hear. So if there's a topic that you haven't heard yet and you're like, you know, I want to know more about this, shoot me a message. I would love to hear some feedback and get to know what you want to know. Just a Pinch podcast was written, recorded, edited, and produced by Kristen Jem.